I am so pleased to be here. What an incredible set of invocations, wasn't it? Just beautiful. Really, uh, I want to welcome you to Brooklyn College. And the college is a diverse place. And in some ways, those invocations represent that extraordinary diversity that we are so excited about. A Little bit of bragging to start us off. Uh, US News and World Report ranks Brooklyn College the number one most diverse campus in the entire Northeastern region. We are deeply proud of that diversity. And one of our favored sons is here today. Uh, Jamani Williams is here today. Now, now, today's a beautiful day. It's bright outside, it's sunny, and it's cold, which is a wonderful metaphor for where we are, right? It's cold, we're feeling it in our bones, and we see far. We see far because the sun is shining. This is a moment where Jamani Williams gets to be sworn in, right here in his home, his alma mater. He graduated from Brooklyn College in 2001, the first time, with a bachelor's degree in political science. He then graduated again in 2005 with a master's degree in urban policy. And he was active, highly active, in the student government right here at Brooklyn College, protesting on the quad. <laughs> to the president then, I think. <laughs> he cut his political teeth here, and he is now a favored son here. He graduated from Brooklyn College and went on to such extraordinary political success and such impact for the people he represents here in Brooklyn and now across the city. We are so proud of him. We are so pleased to have so many of you here with us, including this extraordinary team of dignitaries. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and, and I just want to say that Brooklyn College welcomes you all. Uh, uh, it is an honor to be the first place where Jamani Williams sort of makes his debut as public advocate. He's been a staunch supporter of CUNY, the system of public education across New York City and across the state and especially, here, here, let's do a round of applause for public education. That's right, that's right. And especially an advocate for Brooklyn College. We are deeply grateful to him. We are grateful to be able to host you all here today. And I, I welcome you all to Jumani Williams' alma mater. Thank you. the former public advocate for the city of New York, and the first to ever hold the office, Mark Green. <clears throat> I'm um, so pleased to be here to kick off uh, the proceedings. Um, for someone who has gotten elected twice in his first year, that has to be a record. Um, uh, before I do, though, I want to do uh, acknowledge two tranches of six people uh, because they are extraordinary democratic leaders of our state and city. Um, uh, please give another big Brooklyn welcome, and I ask to stand uh, Attorney General, former public advocate Tish James, and for uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, Com State Controller Scott Stringer. Borough President Gail Brewer. And this was not in the program, but <clears throat> because we are in a national break the glass emergency, please give a loud cheer to two men who are not here, but were on the floor of the United States Senate last night doing us proud, Hakeem Jeffries and Jerry Nadler. Boy, they were extraordinary. Um, 
When I was in law school, a uh, professor of mine said, quote, those less favored in life should be more favored in law. Now, this is not literal because of the 14th Amendment, but it was a good figurative way uh, to describe what inspired me to be a public interest lawyer and ultimately uh, the public advocate. Um, that is, capitalism exists to produce products, but democracy exists to make sure that everyone, in uh, Thomas Jefferson's immortal phrase, can pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, this ethos led to a government based on the rule of law until now, but basically still true in New York City, um, that in turn led to civil rights laws, labor laws, regulatory uh, laws, the Americans with Disability Act, uh, Obamacare. That is, the Office of Public Advocate, uh, uniquely in the city, reflects this governing structure providing opportunity to all who feel left behind, uh, shut out, lacking the lawyers and the lobbyists to make their case before uh, decision makers. In fact, uh, when President Bill Clinton in 1998, I, I invited him and he came to the Huddy Middle School in Brooklyn and uh, spoke on the uh, um, uh, tobacco-free uh, kick butts day. And he said, oh, Mark Green, I'm sort of the public advocate for the whole country. A, I told my mother, and B, Jumani now has a high standard to live up to based on the history of the office, the history of the city. Two men who held this position, though with a different name, were Al Smith and Fiorello LaGuardia. Whatever happened to them? Um, and I don't know anyone in this borough or city who can better live up to that than the person that I'm introducing today. So what a perfect fit of a person whose public life has been based on this premise of those less favored in life should be more favored in law uh, to an office that also em uh, is an emblem of that. That's why I'm so proud to have supported his candidacy and now watch him apply the values and talents of a lifetime uh, to this office. He's made the office his own, uh, building on the work of some of his predecessors, some of whom are here, also Bill de Blasio, uh, Betsy Gottbaum. And uh, that's why I want to welcome uh, Germani. As we know, the public advocate to be a voice of the people, has to be with the people. And what better way to do this than today's State of the People address, uh, ideally kicking off an entirely new tradition. So from the first public advocate to the sixth, uh, let's all welcome <clears throat> the person we're here to support in a campaign and in office, public advocate, Jamani Williams. and his mother, Patricia Williams. Stand over here. Um, put your left hand on the Bible, look, legal. You're, you're sweet. I, Jemani D. Williams. I, Jemani D. Williams. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. 
That one always gets me a little bit. But uh, that I will support <laughs> the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Charter of the City of New York. And the Charter of the City of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Public Advocate. And I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Public Advocate. Of the City of New York. Of the City of New York. According to my best ability. According to the best of my ability. Subscribed or affirmed before me this 22nd day of January 2020. I'm the public advocate now. <laughs> uh, it was witnessed by Michael McSweeney, city clerk, clerk of the council, and filed in the office of the city clerk this day, which was done in December 2019. <laughs> you are now the public advocate of the city of New York. <laughs> What's up, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to my alma mater. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that awesome introduction and for the introduction of the Public Advocates Office itself. And thank you to uh, my mother, who's been called the Mariana Rivera of campaigns, uh, for swearing me into office. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I know our protocol has been established already, so thank you all who came out to hear us. Thank you to my family, to my friends, to my team, to my colleagues in government and in activism. Now, as I'm sworn in, I'm looking forward to continuing to cause trouble with, and sometimes for, all of you here today. A quick breakdown uh, on how it works. I've caused trouble with my sister, who I know uh, wishes she could be here today, uh, for my mother, and as for my fellow elected officials in the audience, it's definitely been a little bit of both. And uh, for my fiance, uh, it's probably to be determined. <laughs> I want to offer my deepest heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to each of you, not only for, with me now, for being with me now, but for everything you've done to help me get to where I am today, now, and for many decades. It feels particularly and incredible to be here, of all places, back at Brooklyn College, my alma mater. Brooklyn College is where I met partners, I met friends, some of whom who are here right now and have become lifelong parts of my family, and some people we've lost. Uh, I think of Council Member Lou Fiddler, who I met while a council member here and actually helped put me on the path to public service. It would be great if he was here with us, uh, even though I know he may not ad agree with everything I'm going to say today. Uh, but as usual, he helped teach me that you can still listen and be respectful. <clears throat> it's emotional to be on this campus. It's where I lost and won my first elections. It's where I staged my first protests. It's where I learned how to take what I had and do what I could to, the most good, to do the most good for the most people. It's where I represented in the city council. Uh, it is where my mother probably thought I'd never graduate, much less give an inaugural address as public advocate. <laughs> It's also where I helped grow up to become a man. And that growth, that learning, sometimes it takes a while. I spent a lot of time here. I took seven years to get my four-year degree, four years to get my two-year degree, and 20 years of public service, over 10 in public office. Getting here. <laughs> getting here, becoming a citywide elected official, stems from the support I've had from the work I've done with this particular community. And I want to thank everyone here for helping me to put me where I am and for bringing me back here on this stage in the 45th district where we are today, now led by Council Member Farrell Lewis. It feels very good to be back. The story of getting back here is one of a long path, a long struggle, 
but with victories along the way that powered me toward the next step of successes that helped spur action. And I think that's true not only of me, but for so many of the fights we're in. It's why I talk about myself often very personally, although it's hard. The reason I'm so passionate is because the things I'm fighting for are personal, not just for me, but for the people across the entire city. Too often, the policies proposed and implemented in City Hall and the state capitol are abstract and detached from what people are really seeing and feeling in their lives. We've heard proposals this month in the state of the state. We will soon hear from the state of the city. But today, I want to talk about the state of the people. <clears throat> the people are the core of New York City. Theirs are the voices I've heard and the ones I am in this office to amplify. The people are struggling, and yes, sometimes the people are scared. The people are facing a rising tide of hatred and bigotry, whether our Jewish community confronting anti-Semitism, our trans community facing systemic violence and rejection, our communities of more color subject to systemic racism and personal prejudices, and our undocumented families are targeted for degradation and deportation. And we need to be united in opposing that rise. Now the people are also standing up and they're standing together. The people are not a monolith. There is a great diversity of thought, of background, of experience, and in order to serve all the people, we need to recognize that, while also recognizing that we all actually want the same thing. Affordable housing, safe streets, quality education, good jobs, a clean environment, for our children to do better than we did, and for our voices to be heard. And the people are hopeful that we can move forward. We can build on past progress and create transformational change. I want to speak today about the hard work of long fought progress, because we have seen progress. I know sometimes this work feels like Sisyphus, pushing the bowler up the hill. It feels like the challenge is too great, the goal is too lofty. At times, the people get tired. But it is in these times that we look to our past victories, to the gains fought and won as inspiration and invigoration for what's next, what we the people need and what we the people can do. For me, there's no clearer example than housing. As folks know, I was a tenant organizer 20 years ago, and I'm still at it. 20 years of seeing New Yorkers living in untenable, unacceptable, unimaginable conditions and working to change them of going to housing complexes and housing courts and standing up to big real estate and bad landlords. For decades, the real estate industry controlled politics in Albany. But last year, tenants had had enough. From Brooklyn to Buffalo, we came together to demand housing as a human right in New York State. Week after week, thousands of tenants descended on the state capitol to protest, to rally, and we were even arrested. After decades and decades of struggle, finally we won. Today, it's harder than ever before for your landlord to evict you from your home. It's harder for your landlord to raise the rent and it's harder to be harassed out of where you live. We still have so far to go. We can invest in our public housing and we can eliminate evictions and homelessness in our state. Together, we can win housing justice for all. We have seen victories in this fight. As more people join the cause as tenant power bills, as the movement has grown, we have seen movement in our laws, from Albany outward. In 2019, the movement shook the state in a way I've never seen before, thanks to the work of people like Sia Weaver, who's continuing the, first here, the fight here today. Less, Less than two weeks after I and dozens of others were arrested at the governor's door, but after 20 years of knocking on them, the most sweeping steps of housing justice in decades moved that boulder upward. And that movement is still gaining speed. The victory in Albany last session has shown the power of tenants united and voting. It has also shown our path forward. We're redefining what's possible. We're going to continue that path by uniting upstate and downstate in a push to make good cause reality throughout New York. I found that every time we make progress, bad actors find a new way to exploit the system. 
to push back on us as we struggle with that bowler, to force us to find new paths. But as tenants gain power, big real estate and bad landlords are finding new ways to put profit over people. And we're calling them out by name. Just last month, we released a list of the worst landlords in New York City. A rent check. <laughs> a rent check should, at the very minimum, buy safety, security, and shelter. However, in case after case, violation after unchecked violation, these landlords demonstrated an inability or unwillingness to live up to their end of the bargain. In the coming weeks, I'll be introducing the worst Landlord Accountability Act, making sure, <laughs> making sure the worst practices of the worst landlords are met by the strongest laws. It's critical to limit self-certification, increase penalties for failing to make or lying about the status of critical repairs, and bring transparency to ownership of properties. This past year, we passed a law to bring transparency to affordable housing wait lists and lotteries, and we will continue to shine a light on shady management companies and mismanagement practices. But, okay. but number one on that list of mistreatment and mismanagement is the city itself, NYCHA. An agency that has earned a new chair, a federal monitor, but not its tenants' trust. It's also earned the top spot on our list, and in the coming weeks, we'll be putting a specific spotlight on the most culpable, least responsive developments in the city, demanding more funding and better management of those funds. We'll also be pushing, you can clap, I'll stop every time. We'll also be pushing legislation to create a tenant-centered task force to solve problems by focusing on the people facing them in their daily lives. In 2015, I became homeless when my landlord tripled my rent overnight because of preferential rent. I lived there 35 years, so I went to the city, but they couldn't help. One day I saw the mayor at his gym, asked him to fix the housing plan that he had so it truly favored tenants and not landlords. Since then, we've made some progress. And Albany passed laws to make sure that what happened to me will never happen again to another person. In the city, tenants stood with the city advocate, with the public advocate, with the city council and the speaker, and they worked to make true affordable housing a top priority to create an effective plan that reduces homelessness by creating permanent housing. Today, I'm still homeless in a shelter, along with tens of thousands of other New Yorkers like me. I just want to go home. The affordable housing and homelessness crisis are one crisis with a shared solution to build and preserve truly affordable income-targeted housing, especially for homeless and housing insecure people like Ms. Flowers. Ms. Flowers is joining us, and she's still in search of housing for herself and so many other New Yorkers. But as we have seen, it's not just about having more housing, but better housing, sustainable housing, supportive housing. The fight for housing justice isn't only about who owns the building, but where and how it's being built and who is forcing out through rising rents, rising profits for developers, and the fall of neighborhoods that have been built and sustained across decades. We are going to work with our partners in the city council to pass a law that mandates a racial impact study ahead of any potential rezoning. To know the damage, to know the damage that could be done and to prevent it before it's too late before we see people driven from the neighborhoods by the forces of gentrification. Whether you're trying to pay the skyrocketing rent on a studio or facing foreclosure, foreclosure on a split level, we will be working for you. We are going to help New Yorkers go home. A home, a home means community. It means stability. It means security. It means safety. And when it comes to safety, we're looking to our streets and our subways. We're looking to the systems which criminalize and demonize communities by design and how we can redesign, reimagine, and redefine what public safety means. That work for better policing, for safer streets, is something I've undertaken since I first took office a decade ago. 
10 years of protests for action, of marches for peace, and for, all for, and for officers and civilians alike, of too many funerals. Five years since Eric Garner's. Five years ago, my son Eric Garner was killed on Staten Island streets by NYPD. Ever since that day, I fought the NYPD and the administration for transparency, accountability, and justice. In the last year, we finally got some action, but not full accountability. We started a movement to improve the city's justice system, and we won't stop until we know that what happened to my doesn't happen to anyone else. On the strength of activism, driven by real tragic stories, we have seen real tangible change. We took on the abuses of stop, question, and frisk. We put an inspector general over the NYPD. We made sure New Yorkers have a right to know why an officer is stopping or searching them. This progress has been real, but it's also been slow. It took four years to first pass the Community Safety Act. It took five to fire Daniel Pantaleo. We need to move forward to strengthen the transparency and accountability that have been even li further limited in this administration to fight to repeal 50A and reveal body camera footage, to continue to fight bias-based policing and support transgendered women and others who are targeted by laws while deserving enhanced protection, not enhanced enforcement, and to utilize newly strengthened civilian oversight and bring real accountability. We have work to do, and Ms. Carr is in that fight for justice, knows that we won't five, wait five years, nor will we wait for the NYPD. But public safety, although it does not equate policing, it does not exclude it. Better policing is a part of keeping New Yorkers safe, and the NYPD are our partners in public safety as we take on immense challenges together. But police cannot and should not be made to do everything. It's unfair to the hardworking officers in our city and to the people they serve. Some of the most pervasive problems facing this city, from gun violence to addiction to an ongoing mental health crisis, see their solutions not in over-criminalization, but in targeted intervention, prevention, and treatment. <laughs> when I first got elected to this office, I discussed my personal mental health struggles and successes. In the years since, my team and I have reported on and work to develop strategies to fundamentally change our city's mental health responses and to separate it from a criminal one. In the coming year, we'll push for implementation and funding of that plan, expanding mental health crisis options to, mental, sorry, mental health care options to prevent crisis and expanding respite centers for New Yorkers experiencing them, creating an emergency line specifically for New Yorkers in mental health crisis a direct line to mitigate the emergency, not to exacerbate it. We'll also be pushing to realign budget priorities to this holistic approach. In the last year, we have been part of a shifting the conversation. Now we need to shift the money. We need to put resources and focus on into the systems we know work. The crisis management system, which puts violence interrupters on the ground and works to build up communities threatened by gun violence, has together with the Mayor's Office of Gun Violence Prevention done its part to help bring about a New York City that is the safest it's been in 60 years. A trend that's coincided with several years of increased funding for the program. And I know, to a victim of crime, these statistics mean absolutely nothing. But to the lives saved, the gains mean everything. Yet the crisis management system, after years of fighting for increases, sees 30 million in funding. The police department, who I have to stress is one of our partners, has over six billion. And with those billions, we are too often taking on some of the wrong problems, often contributing to over-incarceration and sending thousands to, into a system focusing on punishment and failing on justice, a system where 
Whether you receive that justice too often depends on who you know and what you can buy. As an office, we're working to disrupt the school to prison pipeline with more social workers and less suspension. A restorative justice model for students that need education, not incarceration. As we work to destroy the prison industrial complex, we also need to radically change what's happening inside those walls. We are dedicated to ending solitary confinement in the state of New York for Leline Polanco and Nicholas Feliciano, for Khalif Browder, and for so many others who have been subject to that torture. Now, I mentioned Khalif Browder because in his name, New York has finally moved to reduce, not end, cash bail, which criminalized, <laughs> which criminalized poverty and kept people locked away without a trial, destroying lives and communities. These new reforms need to be paired with programs and systems in place to help those who've been arrested, which I have some experience with, uh, or incarcerated, which I do not to succeed once they're out. It's why we've passed a first in the nation law to ban THC testing in the hiring process. That's why we passed the Fair Chance Act to ban the box on job applications. And it's why with, again, our partners in city council, we're going to expand that law to help more people in our city get another chance. As we know, as we've seen, so often, it's not about giving someone a second chance, but actually a first opportunity. <laughs> As many of you may know, I'm a public school baby from preschool through college, this college. <laughs> and it's from preschool to college that we are failing our students in funding, in facilitating a classroom for students at all learning levels, and in fostering a diverse educational environment. I'm a sophomore at Hunter College, and I've been in the public school system my whole life. My father left his family, his language, his culture, and his land behind, and came here with only a few dollars with the dreams of giving me a quality education. 20 years later, I'm wondering if it was worth it. We not only live in a tale of two cities, but in a tale of two school systems, where a kid's race and his socioeconomic status determines the quality of his education. We need to empower student voice, to create a fair and just education system for all in the greatest city. He was gonna say the greatest city in the world, New York City. <laughs> New York City schools are among the most segregated in the nation. Probably actually the most segregated in the nation. And our current policies are only exacerbating these systemic failures. We have a curriculum of separation that divides students by zip code, by race, and false perception of abilities. Well-intentioned reform are being put forward without consideration of intended consequences, from removing the SHSAT to entirely abolishing the gifted and talented program. As someone who experienced both, I know we cannot solve problems by pitting communities against each other, only by bringing them together to fight for increased access points, listening to both research and experience. That's why in, this, in the past year, our office has engaged with the people who are most impacted by these decisions and the voices most often ignored, students like Muhammad Dean. We've gone from the classroom to the committee room, and we passed legislation ensuring our work today school, of school diversity extends beyond one administration or one action. These failures follow, unfortunately, our students into college. In the CUNY system, that represents the backbone of New York City higher education. Chronic underfunding from our city and state are threatening the operational quality of the system and the educational quality of student experiences. We gotta make sure that our system stays strong so you can grow up one day and give a speech even through technical difficulties. <laughs> but as we outlined in our office's report just a month ago, we know how this can be fixed. And actually so does CUNY. We're pushing the mayor and the governor to commit to students with real, sustainable funding, and we plan on holding them to that commitment. We need to extend that level of commitment from the campus to the workplace. Too often, New York City's people are overworked and undervalued. 
We've won victories in the last few years, from protecting the right to reasonable accommodations to helping bring reproductive justice to the workplace. But we still lag behind where we need to be on a national and a worldwide stage. New York City should lead the way on workers' rights, especially amid a national environment that treats those workers less like people and more like a commodity or a talking point. Every, you can clap, I'll stop every time. <laughs> every employee deserves paid time off to address their mental health, family, and other fundamental life needs, to say nothing of a simple vacation. Half a million employees in the five boroughs have no guaranteed personal time off. And just as we were among the first in the nation to implement paid sick leave laws, we must move to enact legislation I first proposed in 2014 to enshrine the right to relax. <laughs> After five years with this legislation and the many decades of work that led us to this point, we can seize the moment and create transformational change for workers while uplifting and supporting our small businesses. Together, we're going to get this done. It's time to give New Yorkers the opportunity to take a break. In order to have equity of opportunity, we need equitable access to resources. And we need to protect those resources. I'm especially cognizant of that need and of our failures to meet it as we stand today on the traditional Lenape land. Over decades and centuries, we have seen the overuse of our natural resources in this city and actually worldwide. In the last few years, we have seen our country retreat from its obligation on the stage to prevent that overuse. And in just the last few months, we have seen misuse by companies who have left New Yorkers powerless while exerting their own. We live in an extractive economy that perpetrates inequity. Communities of color and low-income communities bear the brunt of pollution and environmental hazards. At Uppers, we work on climate justice. I believe that your socioeconomic background should not restrict your access to affordable clean energy. The city needs to honor frontline leadership in implementing local climate solutions, like Sunset Park Solar. Near its first Clap it up. <laughs> when Con Edison can oversee historic blackouts, leave New Yorkers in the dark until it's too late, and then get a right rate hike. When National Grid can hold people hostage in an effort to build a dangerous pipeline and further disrupt our environment and get a rate hike, it's long past that city and state government move to pressure them to step up for the people who are depending on their services and quality of life. I've gone to these major utilities, and many times it's made me want to go elsewhere to restore power to the people with public power. The larger the scope of the crisis, the more bold the ideas we need to explore. And the corporate-fueled climate crisis is among the largest we've faced. We've put in place emission standards and construction standards to limit pollutants. And we can put in place systems to limit these monopolies. <laughs> Power doesn't need to flow from large corporate interests. It can come from communities and from committed activists like Summer Sandoval. Summer has brought that advocacy here with a coalition of groups. <laughs> and with those coalitions of groups, we have seen a successful community solar program, a movement driven by neighbors, powered by renewable sources, and one that must be expanded by a city that claims to be environmentally responsible, but is neither reaching far enough in those aims nor reaching all communities with them. Our city's infrastructure needs an environmental upgrade in expanding green spaces and committing to clean water protection and building barriers to stand against the natural disasters we know are on the horizons and on our shorefronts. Creating all of these changes, igniting this movement building, is going to take a level of engagement we've rarely seen in this city, uniting and empowering individuals and in community. In November of 2016, an incredible thing happened in our city and our country. A movement was ignited. The man in the White House is an embarrassment, a bigot, and an immediate threat. But he's also the greatest organizer I've ever seen. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people have risen up across our city to fight back against initiatives from the White House. And as an activist elected official myself, as an office full of organizers, 
we have worked to support those efforts and empower individuals organiza and organizations. I've lived in this country with my wife and my family for over two decades. I am from Trinidad. I am a person of color and I am an immigrant. Two years ago, I was taken from my city and my family by ICE. They said they will gain my removal. Fortunately, people rose up to fight back and to prevent my deportation. And I'm still here. But so many others are not so lucky. And every six months, including tomorrow morning, I have to go to ICE not knowing if I will walk back out. New York City should be a sanctuary city. But so many people, like myself, live under... Be still afraid. We've gone into communities most marginalized, most targeted by this administration to help them know their rights in the face of ICE raid and bigoted policies. We've pushed to make sure that regardless of immigration status, New Yorkers can get job training and a driver's license. Yeah. We have fought back against every attempt by this administration to otherize communities, stood up against the targeting of people like Ravi Ragbear. I'm so proud that Ravi is not only still here in this country, but here with us today. And has been the case for a while, I'll be with him tomorrow morning. <laughs> those of us with the power, with the privilege, need to stand up for those being attacked. We will not disappear. We will not be discounted. And we won't allow the discounting of communities as the Trump administration has attempted to damage the 2020 census, to disadvantage communities of more color through scare tactics and unconstitutional actions. We're working with groups on the ground to secure funding and ensure marginalized communities are counted without fear, that they can stand up and be heard in this census, to ensure that their voices and their numbers are represented by our government. Moving forward, New Yorkers need to make their voices heard not only in the census and in the streets, but at the ballot box. And we need to ensure that voting is a right, not just a privilege. In the past year, we've seen the passage of early voting, automatic registration, and ranked choice voting. But over years, we've seen limited polling sites, long lines, and broken machinery. The upcoming elections are among the most critical in our lifetime. And we need to be able to have confidence that every vote counts. Unfortunately, oh. Unfortunately in our state, some would-be voters are locked out by being locked away. It is long past time for everyone to be able to vote regardless of incarceration status. <laughs> and just for those who think we're dreaming pie in the sky, it's already a reality in places like Vermont and Maine where the population looks a little bit different. And New York needs to step it up. Being in the system shouldn't deny you the right to vote to change it. We cannot create second-class citizenry in New York City. And that means everyone, no matter national citizenship status, has a right to vote, needs to have their right to vote restored for municipal elections. This is a restoration of rights. <laughs> Even under current laws, New York's diversity is celebrated in our neighborhoods, but curtailed at our polling places. Language access, language access time constraints, are limit and other obstacles are limiting the ability of even naturalized citizens to exercise their fundamental rights. Expand that, that access will mean every New Yorker can be part of the change we are working to create. We need as many people behind this as possible, helping to push that bowler up a hill. And the people, united and engaged, will never be defeated. <clears throat> and that's good because there's so much work that needs to be done. I came into this office with a vision to restructure the position to center it on the people through legislation and organizing. In less than a year, we've made this force truly an event, in, in, we've made this office truly an independent force, working with our partner, that was not a reflection of the CUNY education, truly independent force, working with our partners in, in, to make and create an independent budget. We've put in place borough advocates to meet people where they're at, and deputy public advocates with community organizers to take on the issues most important to them. 
With our partners again, the city council led by the speaker, Corey Johnson, who's here, we passed more legislation than any previous public advocate to this point, and we believe we're just getting started. <laughs> we're going to continue to push for a progressive budget for this office and for the city, one that centers on fiscal and human responsibility alike. The public advocate was created as a watchdog and we're going to extend that oversight power to the people of New York by reviving and reinvigorating the Commission on Public Information and Communication, expanding transparency and giving New Yorkers the tools they need to hold their government accountable. <laughs> this position is about working with and for people. As I move around the city, <clears throat> one I love, I see neighborhoods shifting as rents rise. Students struggling for high quality, equitable education. I see streets that are congested and streets that are dangerous, streets that I need to make march down again. I see communities pitted against each other, communities ignored, communities displaced. And I hear from my fellow New Yorkers and from the people, and the people have questions. The people want to know why NYCHA families have no heat and no say in the changes to the authority. The people want to know why we don't commit to a truly progressive affordable housing agenda when 4,000 New Yorkers are sleeping on the streets tonight, nearly 70,000 in shelters, while luxury apartments remain vacant. The people want to know why the response to trans women of more color being murdered to the entire LGBTQ plus community under attack is so profoundly inadequate. The people want to know why having a disability can prevent you from accessing our subway system and why that system is starved of state funding. <laughs> and the people want to know why people in power don't use that power to do the most good for the most people. <laughs> now, I won't always have all the answers, but my commitment is to finding where they are. I want to make sure that by the time I'm done with my tenure here, no one ever questions again why we need a public advocate, a people's advocate. <clears throat> and you can become mayor or attorney general. <laughs> Over the last 10 months, we've been hard at work trying to reshape the office of public advocate. Over the next two years, we're going to continue our work to reshape the city. Because New York is for the people. It's for the young man in Queens who can't afford the subway fare, can't afford to miss work, and can't afford to fall into an unjust criminal justice system. New York is for the Bronx student who's worried about paying for CUNY or paying for test prep. For the single mom living in a Harlem night development and feeling left behind. For the Staten Island family who sees their property tax rise while the super wealthy sees cuts. It's for the Muslim woman in a hijab fearing to walk through her own community because of the rise of Islamophobia. It's the young person of more color fearful to walk through their streets. The cyclist fearful to cross it. <laughs> New York is for the Brooklyn boy who went from shouting in the streets to becoming public advocate where he still shouts in the streets. <laughs> New York is, is that Miss Ned? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta pause right here. <laughs> this is Miss Ned, my fifth grade teacher. I would not be where I, was, I am today <laughs> without Miss Ned. They tried to kick me out of my junior high school I don't know how many times, and if it wasn't for Miss Ned. Thank you. <laughs> New York is for the people, and for the people, we are going to move New York forward. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whom we just celebrated, said that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. And we know that struggle has been going on for a very long time because it was Frederick Douglass a century earlier who said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And we've seen both. 
I know we can achieve great things because we've done it before. The hill still stretches steep before us. The builder is still a great weight, but we cannot wait because we have the people behind us depending on us. And so I'm happy to say that the state of the people is energized. The state of the people is organized. The state of the people is engaged. The state of the people is strong. And with that strength, we are going to push forward to new heights in New York City, lifting each other up. The people are moving forward. And the people in this room and around the city by each other's side, I'm looking forward to it. Let's get moving. And thank you.